the ancient Chinese proverb says, the man who blames others has a long way in his journey to go. The man who blames himself is only halfway there. Mm -hmm. And the man who blames no one has already arrived. Ooh. Each of us have a choice to make. Are we going to be an actor on someone else's stage or realize that we made the stage? Welcome, I'm Alyssa Nobriga, your host of the Healing and Human Potential podcast, a place for you to discover the multidimensionality of what it means to be human. Over the past 20 years, I've trained thousands of coaches in my methodology, leveraging my experience as a former psychotherapist, and I'm here to share with you all the wisdom and insights that I've learned along the way. Each week, I'll share with you life-changing tools to support you in awakening and manifesting your dream life from the inside out. We'll be exploring the intersection between ancient wisdom and modern everyday life, really diving deep into the art of human potential through the lens of psychology, spirituality, and coaching. Let's let the magic unfold. I'm thrilled to welcome Robert Edward Grant to the podcast today. So we met a few months back at a mutual friend's home and his wisdom, his open heart really spoke to me. So I knew I had to have him on the podcast. He really brings a unique perspective to the world because he has such a diverse background being a mathematician, an entrepreneur, a best-selling author, a former CEO of a major pharmaceutical company, a modern day explorer, an artist, a musician, the list literally goes on. I'm so excited to have his knowledge and wisdom to bring to you today. So specifically, we're going to explore on this episode, consciousness, mathematics, intuition, feminine and masculine energy, as well as the pyramids, and how all of these seemingly unconnected things are in fact related. So I've heard you talk about that mathematics is the language of the universe. So for a 10 year old, how would you kind of break it down so that this 10 year old could understand speaking the language of the universe? Well, I think the first way I would probably try to describe it is by looking at the leaves behind you, mm. right? And the leaves around you. So this place you've set up here is so beautiful. What makes it so beautiful is actually mathematics mm. and the language of geometry. So what we look at as pleasing to the eye is actually the signature of God behind all that is. So even down to, you know, from aesthetic beauty to ratio of music, you know, geometry is the music that we experience with our eyes. Mm -hmm. And it's like when you, have you ever been to a place that's got incredible architecture? Yeah. And it's like, wow, what is it about this place? I mean, mm -hmm. your house is beautiful, but what is it about this place? Mm -hmm. And it's because the way that the architect put together the mathematical ratios of the geometry that makes it so profound. It's like a walking, you walk in, it's like a symphony. Mm -hmm. And when you start to dig into what's actually underlying all of that, then you literally find this divine invisible hand behind all of it. Okay, how does this relate to emotions? Ha ha, I'm so glad you asked yes. this question. <laughs> because everything that we get in this universe around us is just a different form of frequency. Right. So we're looking at a visible light spectrum right now. Mm -hmm. And we're looking at these same shapes that are forming the leaves and all the stuff around you, the wood and the stuff on your floor, you name it, everything, mm -hmm. this cool crystal thing, all of it is based on these same shapes. Mm. Now, I could convert all of this into music. So it would be a different way to experience the shapes that you're looking at. You yeah. could listen to it in music. I could also convert it into texture. Mm. And the texture will have a certain texture. I can also convert it into temperature. Mm -hmm. And the temperature would also have a certain sensation associated with it. Mm -hmm. So then you start to realize, wait a minute, we are simply frequency sensors. That our five senses are now perceiving frequency through the means that we can. And we've got this electromagnetic spectrum. And the spectrum starts with, say, 27 hertz. It actually goes lower. Mm -hmm. You know, we have thoughts and everything that yeah. would be you know, in the Lower vibration. low vibration, mm -hmm. right? So you've got kind of sleep states, you know, what we call theta mm -hmm. awareness. And then we've got delta awareness with a subconscious mind. And then you go up into alpha awareness, which is around eight hertz to 12 hertz, mm -hmm. right? Then you go up into gamma, which is very high above 30 hertz, 30 to 100 hertz. And you've also got beta, which is where most of us are. Yeah, Most of us are in beta. So it's kind of like this, we're alert and reacting to the world around us. Mm -hmm. And we're not perceiving because we can't hear that low of hertz. That's pretty low. The lowest hertz frequency that we could hear easily is probably 27 hertz. Okay. And Pythagoras discovered this. Hmm. 
He did it because he was walking by a blacksmith shop and he would hear the clanging of hammers. Right? He lived in the 6th century BC. He would hear the clanging of hammers on the blacksmith's you know, workshop and he noticed that there was a different tone for each time the hammer would hit something different. Mm. So then he started somehow taking that and applying it to strings, like guitar strings. Mm. And he figured out that if he plucked a string and pulled it taut and he would play a note with the string and then if he pinched the string at the midpoint and he plucked the middle of the string, you know, so he's, he's holding one part of it and holding it here, so he cut it in half, then an octave would double. Mm -hmm. And then he plucked it again, like, do another half on it, and the octave would double again. Yeah. Right? So he's like, oh, this is how music is set up, and it's all based on mathematical ratio, mm -hmm. right, of mm -hmm. two over three or three over two or the cube root of two. All of these are combining together to make this whole spectrum of sound. Mm. Now, we only perceive one octave of light. But the electromagnetic spectrum is massive. So we could take the entire electromagnetic spectrum and say it's a giant piano keyboard. It has 88 keys, right? Except each key represents one full octave. So we could start all the way down at zero hertz and just to keep expanding it from one hertz, hertz all the way up to beyond the light spectrum, mm -hmm. which would be the light spectrum is about 55 octaves higher than the sound spectrum. But they're connected. Mm -hmm. Light and sound are connected. Mm -hmm. We're just perceiving it as separate. But yeah. there's a conversion that you can do on it to basically take it up that 55 octaves and see what is the sound that light is making and what is the light that sound is making. Fascinating. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And so we have senses that take us through each of these. So up to 20,000 hertz, we can use our ears. Okay. After 20,000 hertz, unless you're a dog, of course, yeah. dogs can hear beyond that. Yeah. So they can hear much higher than that. You'll hear this very high pitch whistle sound. You know, mm -hmm. dogs can hear it, but you can't hear it. That's mm -hmm. why those dog whistles, you don't hear it at all. Um, but actually, you could go all the way into radio frequency and then microwave and ultrasound. All of these are used in medical applications. These are all things that have different interactions with human biology and tissue. Mm -hmm. So we can perceive them. Usually, in this spectrum, you could perceive it either through smell, like microwave. Mm -hmm. You could perceive it also, uh, you know, through that's through olf olfaction. You could also perceive it through touching it, and you have heat mm -hmm. significantly, right? So we have five senses to be able to perceive most of the entirety of the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. This, it goes all the way to X-rays and gamma rays and cosmic rays. I think this is starting to explain why. So a lot of my work is around emotional mastery, and mm -hmm. I give people a lot of tools to express the emotion so it moves through the body. And one hack that I accidentally discovered was if people can't express, they can't actually get it out, mm -hmm. matching the frequency of the feeling with a song because actually helps them let that emotion feel met maybe because of the frequency and then it softens it. It's able to be expressed. So I wonder if that is part of it. So it's like it's another oh, way it. to bring it out. No, it's not part of it. It is it. Is it. it. So yeah. the way that we could perceive the green of these leaves mm -hmm. that I'm looking at right now or the flowers that we're looking at is that our eyes frequency is matching the frequency that's yeah. being emitted from these flowers, for yeah. example. It's only by matching the frequency can you perceive it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is true with emotional states. Yes. This is true with everything. If you want to experience empathy, you have to be able to match the frequency. Mm -hmm. we, we don't perceive the world as it is we perceive the world as we are. Mm -hmm. So whatever our frequency is matching to is what we will experience. And that is so important for people to hear because as we do our own inner work, it's never about trying to control the outside world. It's about moving through and shifting our own consciousness and frequency or perception so that we can project onto the world what it is we want to see. Absolutely. So another way to think about this because you asked about emotion. Yes. So imagine now we are this consciousness mm -hmm. And I think of it as, you know, my conscious mind is what I know, mm. what I know that I know. Yeah. Okay. My subconscious mind is what I know that I don't know. Mm -hmm. And my unconscious mind is what I don't even know that I don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. So I believe that we live in a U inverse of perception. Mm -hmm. So what ends up getting reflected to the world around us in our outward experience is actually what's happening inside of us. Exactly. Right? And those frequency matches is what comes up. So if you judge something negatively, mm -hmm. then 
the thing that you just judged, you will only create more of. Exactly. So it's like people or, that say, I keep meeting assholes <laughs> and they can't figure out that they're the asshole. Yeah. Or if they're in love and they're just like, everything is so much easier, right? Or things are a lot lighter. I project love onto everyone. And this is so important for people to hear because we really are sold in a society that it's the outside in approach. If we get the certain things, then we will feel a certain way. And it's really the inside out approach. It is. It's like, this is where we have power and domain and everything shifts and reflects that as a mm -hmm. result. We spend our lives searching for an objective truth mm -hmm. and wanting to build up our ability to have judgment. And then when we realize that non-duality is something that doesn't really embrace the concept of judgment so well, then we say, no, 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 it's discernment. That's different. Mm -hmm. It's not different. Mm -hmm. It's not different. Yeah. So it's funny because people say this to me all the time and I'm like, nice try, but no. Yeah. Right? Because the whole point is the only way that you can realize the, the truth of the universe yeah. is the one love that underlies it all. And that is the realization that the only way to experience fully life if you really wanted to, let's say you want to be the ultimate wisdom keeper, you want to be the ultimate divine aspect of yourself. Mm -hmm. The only way to do it would be to accumulate and create the sum of all possible subjective perspectives of that experience. Mm. And that's what we are. Mm -hmm. We are the one that has divided itself into the many simply for the joy of experiencing all of its aspects through our unique eyes of vision, which have... You know, there's never going to be another in Alyssa. There's never has been one like you in the past because you have your own unique experiences, your own DNA, your own nature, nurture, mix. All that stuff is coming together to form your perception mm -hmm. and your perception bias becomes your reality. Mm -hmm. But the one wants to become more wise. So it needs all of us to perceive it through our eyes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a very beautiful concept, actually, when you think about it and you realize that the only thing that's real in this universe, therefore, is how we feel. Mm -hmm. Because you take all the inputs of the information of all these different sensory experiences we have across the electromagnetic spectrum, and the parts of the spectrum that we cannot perceive tangibly, mm -hmm. with our eyes, our ears, our taste buds, or whatever, then the way we perceive it is through our pineal gland. Mm -hmm. So this would be the extrasensory perception, the stuff that we cannot see the stuff that we cannot hear, but it's still there. It's unconscious. It's unconscious, mm -hmm. right? So it falls maybe in the category of I don't know what I don't know. It doesn't mean it's not patterned. Yeah. Because the entire electromagnetic spectrum is absolutely patterned. So what this means then is we're taking all these inputs in and we are then deriving a series of reactions to those inputs. Now, we've all seen situations where people will experience the exact same experience as someone else and have an entirely different perception of what happened. Yeah. We've all experienced this. Mm -hmm. In fact, you could have the entire same exact thing happen to two people, and one person says, that was so great, and the other person says, that, that was horrible. Mm -hmm. well, do you know why this happens? Perception. Perception, and it's based on your own reality of what you've grown up with. Yeah, conditioning. What yeah. is your conditioning bias? So mm -hmm. in a way... In order for us to be open to learning, we have to learn how to unlearn what we've learned. 100%. Right? It's one of my favorite lines by Yoda in, in Star Wars where he says, you must unlearn what you have learned. <laughs> right? And if you have biases to believe in things or biases to not believe in things, then that will severely impact in one way, shape, or form the types of obstacles that you perceive in your life. Yeah. Because the only real obstacles are the ones that you persistently believe in that then lead to the cascade of feelings mm -hmm. that I'm a victim mm -hmm. or I'm a victor. <laughs> it's up to you. Yeah. It's like if you think you can or you think you can't, you'll be right. That's right. Yeah. It's about what you believe. So I was asked by Donald Hoffman, who's a cognitive neuroscientist, to come up with maybe a way to apply a mathematical equation to human emotion. He's well-published. He's like the, math, the expert in the mathematical mapping of, of cognitive neuroscience. So I was like, okay, I haven't had my coffee yet. <laughs> now, let me think about that one, a math equation for emotion. Yeah. And I was flying to Europe and uh, was on my way to Salzburg, the music capital of the world, mm. you know, one of the music capitals of the world, arguably. And it's where the birthplace of Mozart mm. is. And so I was thinking about music. I was watching this movie, and, and the movie on the flight over 
It was like a romance type movie. And, and it was in the beginning, there was this beautiful romance. And I noticed before they had the scenes where the two, you know, the hero and heroine would meet each other. Uh, the music was very light. It was beautiful. And I'm a musician as well. And I was noticing it was full of major thirds, mm-hmm. which is that da, da. Mm-hmm. We love that. Mm-hmm. We love that sound. And then when it was time for them to break up, inevitably it happens, right? Um, then it was the opposite, inverted pairing of that, which is the minor sixth. Mm-hmm. The minor sixth in music is the same two notes. It's just played in opposite order. Mm-mm. So it becomes, instead of C to E for the major third, da, da, right? It mm-hmm. becomes um, da, 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 da. Uh-huh. And that gives you the feeling of heartbreak. Mm. So wait a minute. The only thing that's really different between these two musical intervals mm-hmm. is that one is played in one order, the other is played in another order. Isn't that what time does? So when we start thinking about that, you start realizing, wait a minute, so is heartbreak already hidden inside of the experience of love? And it's simply looking at it from a different time perspective that in the experience of love is already hidden the seed of heartbreak? This is everything that I speak to. So I call this the paradox of transformation, Mm -hmm. that inside unworthiness is worthiness. Mm -hmm. Inside stuckness is freedom. Mm -hmm. This is everything that I've come to as a licensed psychotherapist. This is, there's a bittersweet, like there, and I don't know that it's, I'm curious if it's time or if it's just fully saying yes to what it is, opens us to the spectrum of what's already here. Imagine having a fulfilling career, doing what you love, working from anywhere in the world, setting your own hours while making good money and a big impact. If that lights you up, then I'm super excited to share with you today's sponsor, the Institute for Coaching Mastery. This is my robust, accredited, year-long certification program for newer seasoned coaches, therapists, leaders, and those just looking to up-level their life in a profound way. We have an amazing community of students from all around the world who have really started their journey to expand with us both personally and professionally. And this experience is designed to give you the three things that you need to thrive. So first, you have all of the tools and support you need to move past what's been holding you back so that you can completely change the trajectory of your life. And then you learn how to masterfully and confidently facilitate transformation with your clients or your team, regardless of your niche, if you wanna do health, business, relationship, or you just have no idea yet, we hold your hand through that. And then lastly, you'll receive my Six Figure and Beyond signature roadmap that's customizable to meet you wherever you are. So whether you want to do high ticket sales, online marketing, or you just want to hit six figures without ever needing to go on social media, we've got you covered. And this truly is the most rewarding work in the world. We have new students now who have a wait list of dream clients in under a year. We also have seasoned students who are doing $80,000 months. And this is really about creating lasting transformation from the inside out so that you can share your gifts and serve the world and all.
talking here. It's too difficult. It's not fun, mm -hmm. right? I see people dying. I see difficulty. This is not the place I want to live in. I'm a star seed. I'm, I'm from another planet, <laughs> right? It's like, so I'm going to come up with something that's like, I just don't feel, I fit in here. Yes, this escape. place sucks. Let me escape. Yeah. Then there's another aspect to this. So how is it that you get to the duality? And mm -hmm. duality implies a particular number. What number is that? Two. Two. Mm -hmm. Duality. So mm -hmm. you got light and dark, you know, black and white, uh, good and evil, mm -hmm. right, right, and wrong. Yeah. right and wrong, arrogant and humble, mm -hmm. and all these things. And one day I was on an airplane and I was like, I do a lot of time on airplanes. And I was thinking to myself, well, are these things really different or only differing in degree? Mm -hmm. They're part of the, this, the other side of the coin. Yeah. So I started realizing do I know people that claim to be so humble they become arrogant in their humility? That's yeah. called piousness. Yeah, sure I do. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. In fact, the people that claim that all these other people are arrogant are usually the most arrogant people. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And they can't even see it. I know. Because a truly humble person perceives humility. Yeah, that's right. That's the frequency that he's attuned to or she's attuned to. And a humble person would be open to the label of arrogant. They'd be like, right. oh, show oh, me more. Show me more. Mm -hmm. Tell me more. That's right. Right. So this is a big shift in how you start to perceive when you start realizing that what you thought was good and evil is actually something altogether different. Mm -hmm. You know what it really is? Mm -hmm. What you subconsciously and unconsciously believe mm -hmm. and you hide it from your conscious mind yep. will benefit you. Mm -hmm. So whatever you believe will actually benefit you magically turns out to be the only ethical imperative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, I need to take this land. We need to kill all these people because they worship a different God than me. Mm -hmm. And my God came to me and said, you need to kill them and consecrate your land and all their possessions to me. Mm -hmm. So now I'm righteous in doing this. Mm -hmm. yep. This is the human story. Yeah, We don't realize that our world is not a world of angels. Rather, it's a world of angles. A world where men speak of moral principle yet act on power principle. A world where we and our, you know, and our friends and everything are always moral and our enemies are always immoral. Mm -hmm. And so we fight every battle on the grounds of morality. Yeah. And we don't even notice it. So what happens is we have to take a step back. Yes. And realize that it all comes down to this number two. So how is it? And I said I was going to explain this mathematically. Mathematically... If I were to take the essence of the number two, how would I define the essence of the number two? Well, I could take the inverse of the number two. That's just 0.5. That's not really anything that different. But if I took its essence, it needs to be infinite. It's like the mm -hmm. spirit of the number two. Mm -hmm. So how could I turn the number two into something that would be infinite? Well, there's a simple function we have in math called a square root. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like finding the basis or the base or prima materia, right, of the number two. Mm -hmm. So you take its square root, it's 1.4142. It turns out all of music splits in the middle of an octave is the square root of two multiplied by the first note you started with, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. It could be a unison note, doesn't 432 hertz. You multiply that by the square root of two and you get 611 hertz. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the diminished fifth that's right in the middle of the octave. So it becomes the half point, the mean value of the square root of eight. Eight notes in the octave, take its square root is 2.828. Take that in half and you've got the square root of two, 1.4142. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So it means that our entire musical experience, which really is just a metaphor for all experience, because I just said everything is yep. geometry, everything is music, so we have an, a basis that's underlying everything that's based on this infinite nature of the number two. Mm -hmm. And I could even say it's a compression because the number two is only one digit. But from that, I can give you a number that's its essence, that is infinite and will encapsulate every conversation that ever existed and every conversation that will ever exist uh -huh. because it's infinite. Uh -huh. It's the nature of infinity. And it has no repeating decimals, no patterns within it. Mm -hmm. The it's foundation. perfect. The it's a foundation. It's the foundation of duality. Yeah. The spirit of duality. Yeah. Now, let's take that number. And most people don't know this, but 
there's something special about the number three. Most people like the number three. They don't like the number two so much because of the duality implications mm -hmm. of it. I don't know that many people that say two is my favorite number. Mm -hmm. Ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. I don't know that many people. I don't think I've ever heard anyone say that to me, mm -hmm. but whatever. But number three, that implies something else. We immediately think of a triangle, mm -hmm. right? And what else do we think of when we think of three? In a religious sense, we think of mm -hmm. Trinity, mm -hmm. which has a divine aspect to it. So the square root of three is the essence of the Trinity, the essence of divine aspect. So now if we take the square root of two and we add it to the square root of three, guess what it equals? Hmm. Approximately pi. <laughs> so wait, we have duality yeah. in its essence, adding to Trinity's essence of divine nature, mm -hmm. and we have full circle? Of pi? Mm -hmm. Isn't that interesting? Fascinating. Now, the square root of two is associated with the planet Saturn. Mm. Even the alchemical symbol for Saturn in, you know, when you, you see all the symbols that we use in Zodiac and everything, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the same as the alchemical symbols. The symbol for Saturn looks similar to the square root of two. Mm. Uh, is this all coincidence? I don't think so. Yeah. What's the metal that is associated with Saturn? Lead. It's heavy, very heavy. It's very dense. So in alchemy, we're supposed to turn lead into gold. So the square root of two in this context feels like lead. It's all the suffering, all the difficulty, all the nastiness of living in this escape room called earth. Mm -hmm. But when we put it alongside the context of the divine aspect, the square root of three, now it comes full circle. Now let's do something else. Let's see what proportion of that circle of its 360 degrees that has pi as its length, as its circumference, how much of that is associated as a percentage with the square root of two? It turns out that's 0.449. So 0.449 of the circle, so just under 45% of the circle. So if we took that same 45% of the circle and we multiplied to see how many degrees that actually accounts for, mm -hmm. it turns out to be 161.8 degrees. Now, some people might notice 1618 is a very important number in aesthetic beauty. We find it when we look at the waist, the ideal waist to hip ratio. Hmm. We find it when we look at lips, right? That when you want to put dermal filler in your lips, you should put more volume in the bottom lip than in the top lip hmm. because the relationship of the bottom lip should have 1.618, the volume of the top lip. We find that same 1.618 in the length versus the width of DNA. So one DNA strand is 1.618 versus its width of one. Mm. This is called the Fibonacci sequence ratio. Mm. It's called the golden ratio. And everything that we find in it is known as the signature of God. One, six, one, eight. And now with the context of the square root of three, the square root of two, the suffering and the difficulty, the lead mm -hmm. turns into gold. Mm. Now, what does this all mean? When you realize that you are in a simulation of your own making, that you're literally creating it, not just an actor on somebody else's stage, but it's your stage, it's your set, it's your play that you wrote, it's you, the producer, and you, the director, then instead of asking, why did something happen to me? and the universe is happening to me as a concept, you realize, why did I choose this? And that is going to be a sea change in your life. And how can I change this? And how can I change? What was it that I was hoping to learn by creating this circumstance? The ancient Chinese proverb says, the man who blames others has a long way in his journey to go. <laughs> Good. The man who blames himself is only halfway there. Mm -hmm. And the man who blames no one has already arrived. Ooh, so good. Each of us have a choice to make. Yeah. Are we going to be an actor on someone else's stage or realize that we made the stage? This is just affirming everything that I stand for from a scientific perspective. And I love how you bring in math in a spiritual dimension. I mean, I would say that the foundation for everything that I align with spiritually is non-duality. And for people that don't know what non-duality is, it means not two, right? In Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. 
So what is observing is not separate from what's being observed. That mm-hmm. collapses oneness. Not it's a you universe that is actually a U-inverse. U-inverse, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love how you draw the distinction with all of life. There's a, you have a unique perspective because you have so such a diverse background where you can give language to in a very practical way. I mean, even talking about filler, like you, you are so grounded in this. And I, I want to talk more about how people can, because this is everything that I stand for, understand my, my practice is about questioning everything so that it comes back to the open mind, the I don't know mind. And I think most of us, again, are just so conditioned to think that it's really about outside. And what I'm hearing you say is come back to the perspective of how you're viewing things from. The funny thing is we spend our lives, we're born, you know, from our mothers. We come out into the world and we want to seek the experience of the world outside of us. Yeah. But the beautiful thing about it, as we get to this point in our lives, we get through our Saturn return, we get through all these things. And I think of astrology and numerology as just the codes to, it's like your user manual for the matrix. <laughs> That's great. Okay. For the matrix, yeah. It's your user manual. So yeah. just think of it like that. It has value. Yeah. It absolutely does. Mm-hmm. But you, you spend your life looking on the outside for all the answers. Mm-hmm. And then you realize at a certain point that that's not where the answers are because it's just reflecting what's inside of you. But the funny part is all of it, even the outward journey was actually an inward journey because you're just exploring yourself from the outside until you finally realize all the answers are within. I'm the hero that I've been looking for. Uh-huh. I'm, I am that, mm-hmm. right? I mm-hmm. am that I am. Uh-huh. And that is the nature of divinity. Mm-hmm. That's when you have the context of the square root of three, this divine aspect, and then you can apply it to this duality experience. And then all those negative experiences that you had and experienced that were suffering, yeah. difficulty, now you can look at them with a new lens. Every one of us in some way, shape, or form at some point in time or another has had an experience that we've said, that was a horrible thing that happened. Mm-hmm. It was traumatic. It was difficulty. It was difficult. And that was painful. But then with the benefit of time, we can often look back on that and say, that was a great teacher. Mm -hmm. And it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. Mm -hmm. I don't even remember the names of my teachers in junior high, elementary school, and high school that were easy on me. Mm -hmm. But I definitely remember the ones that were hard on me. Mm -hmm. I remember those difficult moments. And I was invited back to my high school to give a speech and get inducted to their Hall of Fame back in 2015. And they had all my teachers there. and I remembered all the ones that were the hardest ones and they're the ones that I gave the biggest hugs to because Mm -hmm. it's like every one of those life lessons, even the ones that were most difficult. Now I look back with such gratitude, Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have changed a thing Mm -hmm. in the retrospect. And that's a, that's a reflection of the work that you've done to say, let me use everything that's challenged me to help me grow and evolve. Yeah. So if we're in a matrix of our own making, you're not going to make the game easy. Yeah. You're going to put yourself in circumstance of discomfort. To grow. To grow. You know, it's like I was just watching on, um, I got the new Apple Vision Pro thing, Mm -hmm. which is like an incredible leap forward in technology design and everything. I mean, it's really way beyond. Mm -hmm. It's, they literally just, it's the best new technology that's come out of Apple since Steve Jobs. Mm. And it's interesting because in the tutorial of it, and I'm not on this thing all day long. I, I had to get it because of I have a one of my uh, companies has a gaming architecture that's a spiritual life simulation game. Oh, it's called Maya. Oh, right. And yeah. you guys will hear more about it, but it's it's very cool. And we've reconstructed the entire insides of the Great Pyramid, so you can actually go and be inside the Great wow. Pyramid and do full tours of it as if you're there, Yeah. right, with these same Vision Pro goggles. And I'll have the Vision Pro version of it next week, so I'm super excited about awesome. it. But we, we, we basically stitched together all the LiDAR scans that Harvard University had done to make this hyper-realistic mm. experience. It's really unbelievable. So, but the point is that this uh, device is amazing. Like I can sit there and I can put myself in Yosemite National Forest mm-hmm. and the only things that I'm missing is the smell. Yeah, which you can easily get. 
Yeah, I mean, I could have a little aromatherapy uh-huh. thing on the side yes, if I wanted I would. to. But I could literally be in this entirely serene nature yeah. filled environment. And at 8K resolution, you, you really can't tell. Mm-hmm. It's incredible. And at 16K resolution, which you know it soon will be, it will be more real than reality. Mm. But the thing that I really hit me was when I wore this thing, I'm like, I took it off after playing on it for the first 10 minutes. I'm like, wow, we really live in a simulation. Yep. Because you can see how easy it would be. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I was watching this uh, one program on Apple TV Plus because that's one of the things that, and the cool thing is all the panoramic videos and everything that you've, or the panoramic photographs you've taken now can all be immersive. So all the ones you've taken for the last five, 10 years, mm-hmm. you can actually go inside those now. It's like like they're totally hyper real. Mm-hmm. It's unbelievable. And the cinematic one that was on iPhone 14 also is also hyper realistic. Mm-hmm. So I was uh, I was watching. The first thing I saw was there was this Alicia Keys video. And she's singing. And you're in this room that's like with her friends. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. And she's like talking. Oh, she's like right in your face, like yeah. super in your face. And it's just like being there. Yeah. It's like mind boggling. And then um, there was this uh, this other program called Highlining, which it shows this woman who goes to the fjords in Norway, and she sets up a high, you know, like a tightrope across these two huge cliffs. I'm just thinking about, okay, I'm going to know where you're going. Yep. And it's so real. And you're watching this and you're like. <laughs> you can face and- your fears of even heights or whatnot and use that for your own exposure therapy and moving through things. Exactly. Yeah. And so maybe that's what this life is. Yeah. So she's on this tightrope and you're watching her balance on this thing. And it's so hyper realistic. Mm-hmm. You're like, ah, you're like freaking out, right? Yeah. And you start asking yourself the question, well, if I was going to create a game for myself, mm-hmm. knowing that the biggest payback is going to be a spiritual and perceptual expansion. Mm-hmm. I would not put myself in easy circumstances. Mm -hmm. I would challenge myself all the way, Mm -hmm. especially if I knew that death wasn't real. I wouldn't be happy climbing the hill behind my house. I'd want to climb Mount Everest, Mm -hmm. even though I know that there's dead carcasses along the way. And I would want the game to be so hyper real that I would forget that I created it in the first place. Mm -hmm. In fact, I would set it up such that that was part of the programming that because I'm already omniscient, I'm already omnipotent, I'm already omnipresent, I would take away all those special powers mm-hmm. and I would only be able to get them back as I realize their value and importance Yeah, through my own ascension that I would find that the journey is actually within yeah. and I would find the strength within and then I earn my wings. Mm-hmm. And the, the willingness to face the fear actually helps you move beyond it, right? And so that helps you evolve in consciousness. And then you realize it wasn't even about earning. Mm-hmm. It was just about realizing and remembering. Yeah. And then you start figuring out that all those difficult circumstances you faced and you were, you know, you had put thrown in your path were all for your highest benefit and use. Yeah. All for your growing. That's when lead turns into gold. Yeah. So every experience that you've had, you realize there's two sides of that coin. And I, I noticed this even with my work in Egypt because what I found when I was working on the Giza Plateau, one of the first things I did was I looked at the angles of the Great Pyramid, mm-hmm. Khafre Pyramid next to it, and the Third Pyramid, Menkare. And the angles are very different. So I'm like, why would they have different angles? Mm-hmm. You know, so if we believe the dynastic story, it's like a grandfather, a son, and a grandson. So why would, and why would the grandson make the smallest pyramid? Did he squander his fortune? You know, mm. usually people want to build something bigger and bigger. Yeah. yeah. Right. And no one has an explanation as to why the slope angles are so different. The Great Pyramid is 51.85 degrees, 0.85397 degrees, actually super perfect. And Khafre Pyramid is 53.13019 degrees. And, and the Menkari Pyramid is 51.34019 also. So you're like, why did they choose these different degrees? What's the point? Well, you start digging into it and you start realizing that, okay, the Great Pyramid has a ratio of its height to its base of 2 over 1 pi. Okay, that's interesting. So that's another way. One pi is like one circle. That's like one. Mm-hmm. 
mm-hmm. as well. So it's just another context of looking at the number one. The circle, the wholeness of a circle could be one. So then the Khafre pyramid, the second pyramid, has a proportion that is four over three. And that's why it has a 53.13 degree angle. And then Menkari pyramid has five over four ratio. So its height is five over one half its base of four. So you've literally got in the three pyramids that are supposed to be built in totally different time periods, a matrix of numbers that's five, four, three, two, one. Mm-mm. One pi. Mm-mm. Isn't that beautiful? Mm-hmm. Very simple. And within this, the Great Pyramid is the only one, when I take half of its base and turn that into a square from its cross-section, the square perimeter will equal the circle that connects from the base of the pyramid to the apex of the pyramid as its diameter. That'll have a circumference that's equal to the square, and that's something called squaring the circle, which is an ancient problem that was deemed in 1888 to be impossible by Wantzell, a mathematician, and yet they left it in living stone. It's supposed to be impossible. Then the second pyramid has a proportion of four over three, which means that it has a radius of two, right, for the center point of its pyramid, Mm -hmm. and that gives it the perfect circle. How is it perfect? It's the only circle whose radius is equal to its area. Oh, sorry, it's who its circumference is equal to its area. Mm -hmm. The third pyramid has the perfect square embedded within it. Mm -hmm. The only square whose perimeter is equal to its area. So the square represents masculine. Yeah. Right? The circle represents the feminine. Mm -hmm. The triangle represents divine aspect. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that means we've got the perfect square in Minkari, perfect divine masculine. And the Caffrey pyramid, the second pyramid, is a perfect divine feminine. And the Great Pyramid balances the two. And the exact pyramid cross-section of its pyramidal shape, which is the triangle, has an area that's equal to the perimeter of the square that it also makes and the circumference of the circle for the same structure. It's perfect. Mm. So this is why they have three different slope angles because mm-hmm. they're telling a story mm-hmm. and you're about interpreting mankind's it journey. Tell me. So what it actually is making is musical intervals. So the music of the pyramid complex is just da, 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 da. Mm. That's literally what it is. Mm. So what I realized was that each of these relationships of 2 over 1, 2 over 1 pi, 2 over 1, and square root of 2 over 1, gives us unison and a doubled octave and the diminished fifth and the augmented fourth, which are in the middle of the scale. Mm-hmm. duality, mm-hmm. a life of duality, but it's through the duality that we can double our octave mm-hmm. to go to the next evolution for humanity. And see beyond duality. And see beyond duality. And in the process, Menkari Pyramid gives us the major third, which gives us this emotional state of love. Mm-hmm. If you look at it with a pessimistic view You could look at it as instead of the height over one half its base, you look at the full base over the height. And that gives you its inverted pairing, which is a minor sixth, which is heartbreak. So there have been studies done at universities, plenty of universities, that prove, going back to what Donald Hoffman asked me, give me a math equation for emotion. Yeah. Well, here's what it is. Nobody questions that music can entrain emotion. Mm -hmm. What people forgot, maybe is that what is it that makes music but mathematical interval? It's mathematical ratio. Mm-hmm. So these ratios in the architecture, Menkari Pyramid's telling us divine love from one viewpoint, the height over one half its base, and it's telling us heartbreak from the other, the, the full base over its height. Yeah. And then what is the Caffrey Pyramid telling us? It's telling us stability. So when they listen to... This da da da. This the the sec, the first one da da. That's love. Da da. That's stability. Mm. Right, and then its inverted pairing would be C to F instead of C to G, and that gives you loyalty. Mm. And this is peer-reviewed studies <laughs> where they ask people, they list, have them listen to musical intervals, and then report what they feel. Yeah. Okay. So what does this all mean then? Mm-hmm. What it means is, first of all, the entire Giza Plateau is just eight of the 13 musical intervals represented. 
And then I went on a hunt for the other musical intervals hmm. and found that they were in the Giza Plateau itself, as well as a nearby plateau that's called Abu Rawash, hmm. and then another nearby plateau, which is not really a plateau so much, but it's the Djoser complex for the Step Pyramid. And now you've got all the musical scale represented. Mm -hmm. And they're exact proportions that then derive the precise measured values for the slope angles. It's it, all music it, and it's all emotion. And it all comes back to, it's like when you love fully, there's a bittersweetness. There's a heartbreak in that love when you just fully yeah. embrace it. Or when you, when you fully embody, a lot of my work is somatic psychotherapy. When you're fully embodied, you transform and transcend beyond the body. So actually the way through the way out is through, right? There's the wholeness within it. Yeah, that's when you get to the stage where you realize it's not yin yang, it's yin shen yang. The shen is like the chi and the alpha chi omega. We're now moving into the age of quantum computing. Mm -hmm. And it shows up, of course, all around us. Mm -hmm. Right. We see now that we are no longer just male and female. We have an X gender now too. Mm -hmm. In quantum computing, there's a superposition that's no longer just one or zero. It can be either one or zero, and that's an X. So one, zeros, and Xs is the same as alpha, chi, omega. The shen, which is also the Hebrew sheen, which looks like, you know, like three, like mm -hmm. this, or sometimes it's, it's signified by this, the berhat konim, which is a, a symbol that we saw like nanu nanu mm -hmm. back in the 70s <laughs> with Mork from yeah. Mork, and then also uh, Spock. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. <laughs> this is, you know, live long and prosper. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So the point being that we're no longer in just this duality world. We now have an expanded perception and can start to see things from an alternate perspective. Mm -hmm. We start realizing that the things that we thought were good and evil were just our biases. Perception. And that leads to our own perception. And it's very difficult for us to observe ourselves from the outside and be truly objective and say, oh, but are you benefited by this at all? Mm -hmm. yeah. That you think is such a moral imperative? Yeah. Right? It's time for us to descend off the high horse That's right. and realize that it's our bias that we're actually experiencing. That's right. It's reflecting back to us. So all of this, I think, is there to tell us the universe is this giant electromagnetic spectrum of reflection of us. It is a veritable mirror of consciousness. And that as soon as we start to embrace and accept ourselves fully, that's when our world experience changes mm -hmm. and all the people around us starts loving you back. That's right. And instead of having a world that hates you because you hate it, yep. the asshole no longer has to experience assholes. <laughs> Life's a mirror. Life is a mirror. And so everyone we meet is a projection of ourselves where then therefore we can see everyone as an opportunity to learn to love that part of ourselves that we are projecting out because what is unconscious is so hard for us to see that we need it reflected in other. And so everyone becomes our soulmate to help us evolve our soul. Everyone so every person we us. meet, every experience we have can be yeah. a divine communication. Yep to us about our own soul's journey. That's right. And that's one of the most beautiful things that I can even think of. Yeah, me too. You know, as you start to really go down this path and realize it, then your entire world shifts. Mm -hmm. You start realizing, I don't want to judge all this stuff anymore because I've now realized that everything I judge is what I attract mm -hmm. and therefore what I experience mm -hmm. until I no longer judge everything I attracted. That's right. And so the way through is also acceptance, is compassion, is embracing it. And what I teach coaches, the, my methodology, the foundation is acceptance, because ironically, what we accept, we can move beyond, right? Einstein says you can't solve a problem at the same level of consciousness that created it. Mm -hmm. So through accepting it, we get out of this binary, right, wrong, duality thinking. We see above it to something that's more innovative, fresh, and true. And that not, don't know mind helps us open to that. This is why I'm so passionate about doing the inner work, which is not really inner, it's all inner. And because that's the way we can shift the perception of our upbringing to enjoy life, to have the tools and perspectives, to use everything for our freedom, for our own awakening. So, you know, it's interesting. There's a new show on Netflix right now called Orion in the Dark. Hmm. It's a cartoon show that just came mm -hmm. out in February. And 
I noticed it because, you know, I keep seeing Orion in the consciousness and I have this new app that's a social media app that is free speech and fully encrypted and no government can get into. And mm -hmm. it's like really solid. I spent five years building this. Amazing. And it's called Orion. Yeah. And so I, of course, saw this show, Orion in the Dark. And it's this little cartoon about this little boy who's like maybe 10 or 11 years old. And his name is Orion and he's terrified of everything. Hmm. So he lives his life in fear, literally in fear. And, you know, from the darkness is like his enemy to you name it, this is going to happen. He's like super pessimistic. And, and so his parents try to get him over this and they tell at school, okay, tomorrow you need to come back with a permission slip to go to a planetarium. So we're going to go on a field trip to the planetarium and his girlfriend that when, in his own mind, a girl that he's got a crush on, <laughs> um, actually is excited to see him there because she could tell she also kind of likes him. Mm. So she comes up to him and she says, are you going to the field trip tomorrow? I'll see you tomorrow. And he's like uh, sheepish because he was terrified to go. Yeah, He didn't want to go. So, but he wanted to go to see her, but it was like mm, too much risk for him. Mm -hmm. So he went home, he goes to bed that night and there's a storm and his parents are trying to convince him to go. And there's a bad storm outside and it causes an electrical outage. So he has no light and now he's in the dark and his even flashlight battery runs out. And so this, the darkness surrounds him and turns into a monster. Okay. And the monster is haunting him Yeah. in his room. And finally, he's like so terrified of the monster and the monster's like, I'm so tired of people being afraid of me. Oh. You know, this sucks, right? Oh. And, and so he's just like wants to be his friend. And so mm. this sits down and he says, look, come with me. I'll take you around the world for the next 24 hours. And I have to go and do my job and bring darkness to the world. Because I have a place. Because in... I have a place in the world, mm -hmm. right? And, and he has to beat the sunlight, you know, it's going around <laughs> the earth. So he goes <laughs> to all adorable. these different countries all over the world and everything. And it's a great little story. And, and in the process of it, uh, you know, you realize that this is a story being told by Orion now as an adult. So mm -hmm. this is back in 1995. Orion's an adult now. And he's telling the story to his daughter. Mm -hmm. Her name's Hypatia. So he, you know, you're going back and forth between him telling the story. And she's like, but what happened next, Daddy? What happened next? Well, what was whole interesting about the whole thing is that you realize that this is just a metaphor for his own darkness. Mm -hmm. The aspects of himself that he didn't understand. Mm -hmm the shadow that he had not integrated yep. so therefore was fearful of because we fear everything we don't understand, mm -hmm. even the aspects of ourselves that we cannot see. So the whole point of the, of the film was to learn how to accept. It doesn't mean that you have to condone all the negative aspects. That's right, or be a doormat. That's right. Mm -hmm. So we've got this whole thing where... We think if we accept it, we're complacent, Right. Yeah. It's not that. It's acceptance because arguing with what already is is brutal. It's it's just saying, okay, this has happened. Now I have my energy not to resist it. What can I do about it from here? Exactly. It's the resistance. Yeah. So whatever we resist will persist. Mm -hmm. And we can accept resistance. That's right. So mm -hmm. if we can accept and realize what is. Yeah. You know, I'm not afraid of people that have darkness in them. Yeah. Everybody has darkness. There's not a single person on planet Earth that has more or less darkness than anyone else. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting one because people hear that. They go, what? What are you talking about? There's evil people in the world and everything. Oh, yeah, there are evil people in the world. And you know what makes those people evil? Their non-acceptance of their darkness. That's right. I am definitely afraid of people. And I realize that it's all just projections of me. Uh -huh. But I'm definitely afraid of people that believe they have no darkness. Yeah and project that darkness onto everyone else. That's right. Because those are the ones that become the Hitlers. Those mm -hmm. are the ones that become the, mm -hmm. the people that have inflicted terror and pain That's right. on humanity time and time again. I've never heard of a villain who believed himself a villain. Mm -hmm. Villains always perceive themselves as heroes. And honestly, you know, as a psychotherapist, when I heard somebody's story fully, I always had compassion for how they got to be the way that they are. And so to just offer, not to condone, not to say that this is okay in the sense of, you know, we've got choices and consequences. People can go to jail if something that they're doing is, is mm -hmm. illegal, illegal. Mm -hmm. but you still can, uh, we're going to continue in reincarcerating people if they don't actually do some of the work to support any one of us, all of us 
to see our own shadow, to bring acceptance and compassion to it. That's what changes the world. But we need to start with ourselves. Otherwise, you're right. We just keep projecting it everywhere else. It's like all the folks that we want to take a big eraser Mm -hmm. to the world and we say, we're going to get rid of deforestation. Mm -hmm. We're going to erase carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. We're going to erase the animal food industry. We're going to erase all of these things. Do you know the only thing you create by doing that in your matrix? More of it. That's right. More of it. You want to fight against deforestation? Yeah. You might make a small dent in it, but guess what? It's going to be a never-ending battle. Once you realize that you're in a matrix of your own mind, Mm -hmm. the more things you find that you do not accept and you want to erase will keep popping up more Uh and more and more. You don't believe me? Try it. (laughs) What I love about this conversation, and you just have such a brilliant mind. I just want to acknowledge you. I every the work I do is really from the micro, and you extrapolate that to the macro. The same principle. So, how I would say that is, if you resist resistance, it's another level of resistance. And so, as we start to learn these things, it applies to everything else. And I really love how you've brought mathematical equations to integrate the knowledge of the universe, the language of the universe. But imagine. One of the great parts about this film and what the boy finally gets recognition of, because you see the guy that brings the light, who's like the sun, he's like yeah. Helios type of dude. He's got the cool hair. He's like, okay, I'm here. He's like Buzz Lightyear, <laughs> right? And and the dark was always kind of like, mm, you know, and the light comes in and the dark's like, okay, get out of here now. You got to go, right? Mm-hmm. And nobody likes to see you anyway. Mm-hmm. And finally, the boy starts to get an appreciation that the light needs the dark. Yes. And yes. the dark needs the light. When I buy a diamond, the first thing I do is I ask them to put it in front of black velvet mm. so it can absorb all around it so that the light of that diamond and all of its facets can shine more brightly. That's right. And it is through the contrast that makes it beautiful. Mm-hmm. What is love without the contrast of heartbreak? Mm-hmm. What is any experience? What is pleasure without the contrast of understanding what is pain? Yeah. We need all of it in order to transcend. And ultimately what happens in its transcendence is when we finally decide that being right is not so important. Let go of being right. Mm -hmm. Just let it go. Mm Mm-hmm. Literally let it go. Mm -hmm. Your life will dramatically shift. Your relationships will change for the better. Mm -hmm. Your life experiences will change for the better. Let go of being right. Yeah. Once you let go of that and you allow your expression of love to supersede the desire or the need to be right Mm -hmm. and have that objective truth and hold on to that to your last time, you're going to pry it from my cold dead fist moment then you've achieved enlightenment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Enlightenment is when you decide to choose love over being right. I know I had a dream. This is one way that I ground some of this work. I had a nightmare. There was a lot of the Israel, Palestine in October. It was painful for everyone. A lot of people, me too. And I was having dreams, nightmares. And so the way that I was processing it and, you know, we're kind of in condition to think of spiders as fearful and this huge spider was taking over and I gestalted, there's a process in psychotherapy mm-hmm. to gestalt, gestalt and talk mm-hmm. from every aspect of my dream where the spider I was scared of. And I let myself inhabit the perspective of the spider. And when I did that, the spider told me, you're so much more, you're bigger than me. I'm more scared of you. I'm tired. And I just let myself drop into not giving it my power, starting to integrate it within myself. And I feel like The more we do that work within our own psyche, just one person at a time, the more it reflects in our consciousness in the world. And so a lot of the work I'm hearing you say is to bring acceptance to our unconscious, to choose how we're perceiving things, to look at things from a different perspective. And And empathy. And empathy. And empathy. You know, a lot of people say, okay, Robert, you believe we're in a simulation? Yeah. I don't believe it. I know it. Yeah. And because I've had enough experiences now. And if you look at every person throughout history who has been an adept, the one common thread that they all taught was this life is an illusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Without a doubt. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that it makes it easy. It doesn't mean it makes it easy. Mm -hmm. And also very, very importantly, that we should be callous about the experience. Yeah. 
Because if we are and we don't feel the empathy because we're like, oh, it's all a simulation anyway, it's all right. fake. Right. You know, there are Bypass. starving people in Africa, but are there starving people in Africa? Mm -hmm. Once we go to that line of thinking, we miss the entire point mm -hmm. of creating the whole thing, mm -hmm. which is we're here to learn how to love and be loved. That's it. Mm -hmm. The greatest thing you'll ever learn is just to learn to love and be loved in return. Yeah. Straight from Moulin Rouge. <laughs> it's so simple. We are here to learn how to empathize, mm. put ourselves in other people's shoes, and to feel the feelings. Why? Because, you know, when you walk out of a great movie, what makes a movie great? It was immersive. Mm -hmm. You were so into it. You came out, and the TV reporter comes out, how did you feel? It's like after you watched Titanic or something. It's like, that was so amazing. Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. Because mm -hmm. you literally left your real life for mm -hmm. two hours or three hours. And you were immersed in a whole different fantasy world. Like the first time I saw Avatar, it was like that. It's like, wow, that mm -hmm. was so epic. Well, that's what we're creating here. And the entire point of all of it is to realize what is real, and that is how we feel. So to have empathy for all of those feelings yes. is the reason we're here. And what does that mean? It means that God, or the one consciousness, is building a gigantic Akashic record of information, space-time memory, that is all of our collective emotions. The different, all of them derive from different conditioning bias-oriented and mm -hmm. nature-nurture-oriented perspectives that only we, each of us, in our own uniqueness, can actually provide to the universe. Mm -hmm. So we're serving a great purpose. Often people think, oh, you know, I'm not in my ego anymore. You know, I'm not going to have this name anymore. I'm, not. I'm changing my name to One Divine or to, you know, uh, so and so light or yeah. because that person is dead. Even I am. Jim Carrey did that, right? He's like, I'm the person formerly known as Jim Carrey. You know, that was his whole it's a thing. Stage. Yeah. And I, it was, yeah, that was, I mean, yeah. he's a funny guy. I love that guy. Yeah. But we often get in the stage of our awakening process, which is, this disdain that we have for our ego. Yeah. And I think that's a part of the spiritual awakening path. I know for a while it was like, I am awareness, but that was still an identity. It was still an I that was aware. And then there was the rest of life and then needed to really question what was awareness and really saw that awareness is a wearing, but it's not a who that's, a, oh, I'm not <laughs> observing. Meme. It's just an aware. I love memes. Yeah. I think memes could be like, you know, we, we could condense down the entire teachings and all the holy books and <laughs> scriptures humor. into humor yeah. and through memes. And so I saw this one meme of this guy. He was like, looked like he was, you know, probably coming back from an ayahuasca retreat, maybe out of ayahuasca, whatever <laughs> retreat, doesn't matter, yeah. some medicine journey. And, and it was like, you know, he's like, I finally achieved my spiritual ascension and I'm better than all of you. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I actually hit up against my own arrogance in my own spiritual awakening path. And I was so disgusted by arrogance that I stopped, I stopped practicing anything. It was stopped any type of spiritual uh, ritual. And then I realized later that arrogance also is part of the one. That yeah. arrogance also wants to be accepted. Exactly. But it's not just to like the dark guy that just one. wants to be accepted. That's right. Just learn All to accept it. it and realize that it's there and stop trying to erase it in totality. Yeah. It it cannot be erased. That's right. Every action must have an equal opposite reaction. There can be no light without the dark. People think that darkness is the absence of light. It's not. Mm. Darkness is the opposite condition of light. Yeah. It is the absorption of light, yeah. whereas what we see and perceive as light is its reflection. Everything has an absorption. Everything has a reflection. Without the witch, you could not have reflection. Mm -hmm. You must have the darkness. Mm -hmm. So we see these flowers right here as being pink and red, and these would be like you know different colors of green and blue in their absorption. Mm -hmm but we see them as reflection. Who's to say which one is right? Yeah, different perspective. It's just a different perspective. Mm -hmm. So we all get stuck in this mode of not wanting to accept, and I don't think the world's a difficult place because people hate each other. I think the world's a difficult place because people hate themselves. That's right. And they don't accept themselves. And that's the work that we get to do. This is the work that I'm a stand for, and this is 
I feel so passionate about helping people have the tools, the perspective, the community to learn how to accept themselves fully because ironically, then we feel whole. We feel an interconnectedness. It's not even connected because that implies too, but on the psychological and the spiritual, this is everything I'm excited about supporting in the world. I am so grateful for your brilliant mind. This is one of the most enlightening conversations I've ever had. Thank you for the work that you do Thank for you. connecting so many different beautiful aspects of the diamond to help put an articulate way of sharing your perspective. I just so value your heart and your mind. That's why I knew I wanted to have you on the podcast. Mm -hmm. And I know that people are going to want to stay connected. I'm so grateful that we get to stay connected. And I, I want to make sure that people know how to stay connected to sure. the work that you're doing. Sure. Uh, you could find me at robertedwardgrant.com. I'm on all of the, and the people always ask, well, why, why aren't you just Robert Grant? I'm like, well, it's not because I'm pretentious. It was Robert Grant was taken. That was it. <laughs> that was it. It also sounds good. Yeah. Robert so Edward I was Grant. like, okay. So it was the only one that I could use because Robert Grant's not exactly, you know, a, a, a very, very unique name. Yeah. So um, I had to use Robert Edward Grant because all the other ones were taken. But all of my stuff is all related to that. Robert Edward Grant. You can find me on YouTube. You can find me on Instagram. You can find me on all the different platforms. And I think the most important thing that I hope one you know, thing that everyone takes away is yeah. that, you know, I used to spend my whole life collecting facts. I thought I was a good judge, mm -hmm. discerner of things, right? Mm -hmm. I was a CEO. I've been a CEO for 30 years. I've had a lucky life and career. And what I realized at some point was that all the facts that I thought I'd accumulated were actually merely facets of a larger prism of truth that I was only seeing one angular perspective of. And once I started realizing that, then that's when I really took to heart this notion of the more I learn, the less I feel I actually know. Brilliant. And I hope that if there's one thing you take away from all this, it's letting go of being right and allowing yourself to be accepted in your totality, not just the part that you think that you're, you know, projecting outwardly, mm -hmm. that the part that you want to see of yourself in the mirror, yeah. but actually your full self, your full authentic self, who you are. Mm. And there is no separation from you. Just realize that everything you're seeing around you is merely this lens that is basically painted with your own conditioning biases. And it's all you. Mm. There's nothing separate from any of us. And I realize when I see stuff and I judge it, and I believe me, I still do. Yeah, the mind. Right? From the time to time, it always comes up. And then I have pushed myself to say out loud, I am that I am. Whenever I feel like I was going to yeah. say something judgy, yeah. right? I'll just say, I am that I am. And people are like, why did you say that? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, never mind. <laughs> That's my own little internal thought. Mm -hmm. But it really, if you really want to change the world, change your perception on the world. You want to change the world, be the change you want to see in the world. Amen. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So good. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this work that changes the world, starting with yourself. It truly does make a difference. And if you're finding value in this podcast, a cost-free way to support us is by leaving an up to five-star review. It does mean the world to us. And as a thank you gift, we're going to send you one of the most powerful tools that you will ever discover. You're going to get behind the scenes access, showing you how to live into your full potential without letting fear hold you back from stepping into your dreams. Just head over to Apple Podcast or Spotify and leave a review now. You can take a screenshot before hitting submit and then go to alissanobriga.com forward slash podcast to upload it. And make sure to have your automatic downloads turned on wherever you listen so you don't miss any of the upcoming episodes. I have so much magic I can't wait to share with you. And you can find all this information in the show notes below. But lastly, if you're on Instagram, I love connecting and hearing from you. So come on over and say hello. I'm at alissanobriga. Thank you again for being here. I cannot wait to share more with you.